In the good tradition of theater, I feel I have to stand up uh, to honor, as we, we've learned to do at the end of a wonderful performance at Ben, to on, honor Joseph Moore here today. It's just not possible to do it sitting down, Joseph, sorry. Um, I just want those of you who have lived in New York for the last X number of years to just take a minute to close your eyes and try to imagine New York without the next wave festival. Uh, it is actually impossible to do. And in fact, if we go a little further and try to imagine each of our own education in what performance and theater and dance and film and really all the performing arts, what they mean to us, um, again, Joe has an extraordinary place in that history. Uh, it's, I think we should actually start calling BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music, uh, BAM University or something of that level because <laughs> it really is an education to spend time there. In fact, when uh, Joe asked, when actually Joe didn't ask me somebody, but he, we were discussing the other day, I said, you know, I think I spent more evenings at BAM than I did at home. So um, it's that sense of how important um, our lives are with Joe at the helm at uh, Brooklyn Academy. And even something that I think is some, uh, some that I recognize every time I come home is driving back across the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, which is an extraordinary experience. And I think, again, the fact that Joe has made this place for us all to, to go to, even if those of us live on the island, um, this is something also very, very important. I think that there's this relationship with, with New York and with Brooklyn. Um, everybody sitting here also that, that we've spoken, I've spent the weekend having a great time talking to different panelists about how we all feel about it. Joe, and without uh, using too much sentiment, um, there's enormous love and appreciation for somebody who is a producer and somebody who has actually made each of these artists and curators' uh, visions come true. I mean, so you're really looking at an individual whose own vision is to actually allow others' visions to come true, a kind of miracle man. Uh, have a dream, take it to Joe, he will find a way to actually <laughs> realize it for you. So he's a dream maker in a very profound way. Um, other conversations that I've had with Joe always astonish me because there is such a quiet insistence on the ideas that we need to be taking seriously. And it's that sense that he will, he will really put something right in front of you and, and then take you through what this material has meant to him and what it's going to mean to you in the audience, to you as the scholar, to you, um, for your sheer pleasure, actually. This is, he's a pleasure maker. He really seduces each of us, because I know what's in his heart when he goes and looks at things uh, around the world or commissions new work. Um, it's really how he's going to quite simply turn us on. You know, what is, what is going to happen to our lives? So these are really extraordinary qualities that, um, that each of us have talked about that uh, Joe has brought. And also in the, the further conversation uh, with the, the different artists here who've worked with, that, uh, with Joe and, and at BAM, is again a remarkable sense of this clarity of intention, the absolute honesty with which he talks to them and with them about their work. And something that will come up a lot is really the friendships that grow out of these relationships. So I think that's also very, very interesting to hear from each of the artists that role. Uh, I asked a lot of probing questions, and I plan to do that as we open up, because, again, I feel my job is to really expand this idea of what Joe's position is as a, as a human being, as a person, as an individual, shaping New York City culture, but also somebody who, again, asks very difficult questions and pushes each of the artists that he works with, but in the quietest, most gentle way. So um, I'm just going to sort of stir a pot <laughs> and uh, start with David, actually, because David is going to describe, and rather, actually, David, your role first as describing um, the one artist who is not here. And there were many, many artists who uh, really are sending good wishes and love from afar who wanted to be here tonight including also, by the way, uh, um, Harvey Lichtenstein, with, who, of course, worked for so long and brought Joe to BAM, um, who's the, the director for all those many years at uh, Brooklyn Academy, who sends his love, who says he's very proud of you and thanks you for everything you've done while he was there and since mm -hmm. you left. 
Mm -hmm. uh, David is going to read from another artist who is not here, and so I'm going to leave you to describe the, the love letter coming from abroad. Um, so what I'm about to read is not from me. So, um, and if you could see the person who it's from, you would know that, <laughs> because he's much taller than me, and his dreads go down to the ground. <laughs> um, and he's on tour, Daniel Bernard Remain. But because I'm a composer and he is a composer, it seemed only natural that I would read his, his mash note to Joe. Um, I first met Joe Melillo years ago when I was a young artist trying my best to be heard in New York City. Joe answered the call and has been a tremendous supporter of my work ever since. He has allowed me to create, consider, and have conversations with a large and dedicated audience at BAM and throughout the world. Those conversations are with the many young students of New York City, my fellow Harlemites, the Haitian community, and an ever-growing community of like-minded progressives, rebels, and outcasts. Anyone who knows Joe can tell you about his voluminous memory, impeccable taste, and clear vision. It's a relief in a world of compromise, change, and excuses. I need Joe because he makes me remember what I never hope to forget, that art is an antidote to the ills of the world and a conduit for the free flow of ideas and the systemic changes that come with them. I'm a better artist for having met Joe, and in this, I'm a better person, trying to have the best conversations that I can. We love you, Maestro Joe Melillo. <laughs> That's the need. <laughs> Daniel Bernard Remain. <laughs> Are we showing the, uh... yes, there we are. Hey. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> make people wild, give people crazy. <laughs> Joe, here at the Atlantic Center in Florida, thinking about you. Thinking about you. Thinking about all you have done and willed and willed. Celebrations can be dangerous, they can be premature. I want to thank you for taking a chance on a young buck like me. I'm not forgetting about those young people in Brooklyn, throughout New York City. You helped me to remember hard, never to forget hate. And I feel good. I feel good for having met such a good man. <laughs> We're going to continue to do great things. You know, we can never thank you enough. You've changed our world, while we saved some lives. But here's the thing, I wish we could do more. I wish we could do more for you and the people around all of us. So we thank you. We really thank you. But more than that, we would love you. We love you, Joe. Take care. Oh, that's good. Uh, Julia. So nice. Susan, you, um, Susan Marshall, I think you all must know her beautiful, beautiful work. And in fact, some different little parts here that uh, of marriages that Joe, uh, Joe's marriage broke is why I need to explain. He puts people together in the most remarkable ways. And indeed, I believe uh, David and Susan were brought together by Joe. Um, but Susan, you talked about Joe's absolute focus on the artist, and I wanted you to tell that story, which is really quite wonderful. Um, I have two stories to tell about Joe. Uh, going back in time, back into like 20 years ago, 1987, I was having my first meeting at BAM to discuss my first concert at BAM. So this was my first meeting with the big man at his office. And we had started a meeting and people came over to Joe and there was something going on and he said, excuse me, Susan, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, I'll be right back. So he waited a little, I was with my new company manager. And he came back with the news and I think we were there either on dress rehearsal night or opening night of uh, what would have been opening night of Anna Trace at a Kiersmacher, Elaine Rosario. And he said, I'm sorry, we're having a little, a little problem. Um, it seems the chairs for her work, her work is completely based on these chairs. They've been altered and adjusted to support the dancer's weight and no, there's no replica, you can't buy any other chairs. They're, they're caught in customs. <laughs> and there's no replacing the chairs. It's, 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 this is a bad situation. Um, and uh, you know, I said, Joe, I mean, you don't have to have this meeting with me tonight. I mean, this is you, you, stuff you need to do. Go, go do what you have to do. <laughs> it turned out they had to cancel the show. I think one of the few, if only times in the history. Yeah? Ooh. Okay. So he said, you know, just one second more or something. He went away and he came back. And after all my protests, he said, Susan, no. Let's, you're here now. Let's, let's talk about you. Come sit down. And I said, you know, all this stuff. And he said, Susan, it's not brain surgery. <laughs> it's a performance. It's not brain surgery. And I, and I will say that at that moment, there's always with, there was with Joe a meeting of the eyes and a moment of stillness that said volumes more than the remark might have meant because of the background of our lives at that time. We had a lot of friends who were ill and dying. And brain surgery was sort of a, a comment which encapsulated all of that suffering. And in the background of that, it's a performance. You're here now. Let's talk about you. And I feel that that's always, that says a lot about who Joe is. And that was, he, these are early years for Joe. And for him to have this perspective, you know, with a major disaster on his hands, <laughs> to sit down and talk with an artist. And I think with him always the person comes first. And then the artist who happens to be that per the artist person, but the person before the artist. And then the work, you foster the person, and that relationship and the work comes along. It's, it's not the horse before the cart. It's not the cart before the horse. Whatever. And um, I guess the other story that relates to that would be going back a little further to uh, when Joe first asked me to come out to BAM. This was in 1986. 
And I had just done my, I was very young, and I had just done my second concert at Dance Theater Workshop. So really my second for real concert. Dance Theater Workshop is a small theater. For those of you who didn't know it 20 years ago, it only had 100 seats, small black box. And there was one work I had on that program called Arms, a five minute dance for two people. Highly gestural, dense work that didn't actually travel around the stage. That was the work that Joe liked, spoke to him particularly, yes. And, but based on this five minute stationary gestural work, why don't you think about coming out to dance? <laughs> so it's not a problem for him to make that kind of leap. And now here's the part that I think must have been um, something about Joe, a safety or I'm not sure what it was, but I was um, brave enough and I think because of the way he set the tone for the relationship, even on our first discussion, that I could say, you know, I'm not ready. No? <laughs> and he said, that's okay. Why don't we do it the next year? Oh, okay. And that's what happened. <laughs> You're a nice guy. That's about it. <laughs> but I have found that just that, that, that aspect of the relationship has always been um, there over the many years that we worked mm -hmm. together. Each of the artists talked to me about Joe's ability to move almost instinctually when he saw something, as Susan describes, a five minute work with four arms, two people, four <laughs> arms, yeah. uh, and Joe stepping in there and saying, you know, here's one of the biggest, most important stages in America. Come on and let's see what you can do. I think that's extraordinary sense, as we were saying before, of Joe the miracle maker, of somebody being able to have that vision and that absolute trust in the artist that they will move forward. Um, so before we get to describing <coughs> exact, to, to really analyzing a little bit more how Joe operates, David, can you talk about, um, you talked about some of the uh, matchmaking, some of that, those relationships that Joe made for you. Can I read my prepared remarks? You may. <laughs> and then I'm going to remind you some of the other things which, you might Which may or may not be on that topic. OK. <laughs> anyway. Cheater. I'm really sorry, but you know, I, I, I just I didn't want to mess up. <laughs> um, read with feeling. OK, I'll try. I'm going to try. Um, hello. <laughs> uh, that's good. I am David Lang. <laughs> I wanted to write this down because I wanted to make sure that I got in everything that needed to be said. How we love Joe, it's a big topic. I started this by thinking that I should write it down because I want to make sure that I don't leave anything out. But because this remark is supposed to be really short, I'm also positive that I'm supposed to leave things out or we will be here all night. So I'm writing this down to make sure that I leave out a bunch of the things but not the most important things that I can't leave out. Confused? <laughs> Let me start at the beginning. Hi, Joe. Hi, David. I actually wrote down, say hi, Joe, and wave at him because I knew that that was one of the things I didn't want to leave out. Um, I've divided this into a few basic things that need to be said about why Joe is great and how he has helped to keep BAM one of the most important centers of culture in the world. The first is that we are all part of Joe's family, and he is a part of ours. He wants to know the artist as much as he wants to know the art, and he becomes an essential part of the lives of the people who work with him. It is not because he likes gossip or because he's a busybody or because he needs our company. It is because he knows that art runs deep in the emotional lives of artists, and that it is that emotional part of the artist that connects directly to the audience. To get to the art part, you have to get through the artist part. Joe is a friend to the whole of the artist and the whole of the art. And what is the art that he is interested in? Is it popular entertainment? Clowns with big eyes? Mainstream theater? Best-selling novels turned into best-selling dramas with best-selling actors? No, all of Joe's good work has been done in the service of uncompromising, weird, strange, challenging, <laughs> and often very disturbing work. And we on this panel are some of the people who make this weird <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Um, of course, all of us up here love Joe. Joe found us and supported us and nurtured our visions of ourselves and became a part of our imaginations of what we do. 
and we are not the only ones to feel this way. Joe has been a friend to experimental performance wherever he has found it, in theater companies from Holland, dance companies from Brazil, singers from Latin America, pop musicians from Iceland. He has scoured the world to find art that is interesting, challenging, powerful, communicative. He found these things, he nurtured them, encouraged them, spread the word about them, and helped them grow. The amazing thing about this is that by putting all of these strange artistic experiences into one festival every year, it made us see ourselves not as loner, rebel, mavericks, so much as a part of a community of innovators. It turns out that I have more in common as a creator with Susan's choreography or Dan's curating or Marianne's stagecraft than I do with the glorious history of classical music out of which I sprang. <laughs> The innovation, the searching, the experimentation links us together into something much larger and much more provocative than anything our disciplines could create individually. I don't know if I would have felt that without BAM, but the most important thing for me about Joe and about BAM is that an audience has been created there that, like me, is ready, prepared, eager, and willing to dive headlong into the new. The lasting effect of Joe and of Bam, I believe, will be the audience and not necessarily even the art. People who make stuff come and go. We do it for our own reasons and I'm not even sure most of the time why I am doing it myself. But the creation of an audience of people prepared to hear, to listen, to feel something new, ready to get a complicated message and have it change their lives, that is an amazing thing and it is the thing that separates BAM from all the other venues that I know. All of us here today are doing fine, and we tour around the world, and we do lots of exciting things all over the place. It is important that Joe believes in us, but it's also true that Joe is not the only one. It is hard to have a career if only one person likes you. <laughs> Although not impossible. But not impossible. Um, what is different about Joe is not that he believes in us, but that Joe believes in the importance of believing in people like us. He believes that art can open an audience up to innovation, inspiring them to seek actively the refreshment of the world, that art is at its core a challenge to us all to become better citizens and better people. It turns out, after all these years, I also believe this, but I can't honestly say I would have gotten to it on my own if Joe and 25 years of going to BAM hadn't helped me see it for myself. So thanks. 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 David. Oh. I know that didn't answer your question. <laughs> no, it, you did very well, and you didn't leave anything out. That, that we, I think that was really fantastic. Uh, in fact, this, the friendship that you described uh, of Joe, and I think, I think this point about audience is extremely important. Uh, to be able to take an audience with you over all those years. In fact, one of the comments you did make, and you know, that not everything I see at BAM is, is stunning. Why come out sometimes very kind of puzzled, or, or even like, I didn't like that. And that's part of it too, that, that Joe will take that risk sometimes. It might be something that he feels will be good for us, even if it's sort of bad for us in some ways, or even if it's problematic. And that sense that an audience keeps coming back. Because again, that word of trust is what's so important. An audience keeps coming back because they understand that the overall quality, the overall nature of this work is part of the thinking process of the person who's putting it together. Mm -hmm. So that Joe will, will, is essentially saying, I think it's important that you see this and that you go through the process of liking or disliking. It doesn't matter. Just trust me and come and be here. And I think that was a really important part of our discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Thank you for pulling those items back again. I think also another point that you made that was so important was this idea of Joe being available to uh, put other people together from far-flung places. Um, again, this matchmake idea, but in a very deep way where you said, um, and I think Susan was saying that as well, that those relationships all la had lasted, that it wasn't just about uh, saying, you know, here's the best person who does directing, and they're incredible, but, but be careful, they're miserable human beings. <laughs> you know, he made it very clear that Joe would never do that. There was always this consideration, this considered and considerate sense of how two human beings were gonna also function together, both artistically 
and on a personal level. And I thought those were all very interesting comments that came out of my discussion with each of the panelists um, over the weekend. Marianne, can you mm. talk about uh, your stories? Um, I shall. We'll talk about my really stories. What have I done with them? You told me that yesterday. OK. Briefly. Sorry. I, I also wrote things down, but not nearly as neatly as you did. Um, I did come up with a word for this, which is Malillopalooza. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to the Malillopalooza. It's the next <laughs> performance that she's going to do at Ben. No. But I do want to just reiterate that there's so many artists in this community, in this room, in New York, in the world who wish they were here. And I feel overly privileged to be uh, being able to thank you in person. But I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would join me in speaking to this larger whole. So I wanted to tell you just two quick stories. One is about um, the very first night that I actually met Joe face to face. Um, we, the Builders Association, had just started and in fact, we had built our first show in a 70,000 square foot warehouse space in Chelsea, in what is now the che uh, Donna Karen's Atelier at the top of the Chelsea food market, but then was just a rat infested space with, that we rented for $1,000 a month. And we had spent eight months in there creating this show called Master Builder, and that's how we got our name. And we, had, we were excited. We finally got an audience to come in. And I don't know how we managed to get you there. I think Susan Sontag might have dragged you. I think that's true. But it happened to be, unfortunately, in December, in one of those bitter, just absolutely, you know, icicle-rending nights in, um, yeah, right around Christmas. And of course, there was no heat, because it was a 70,000 square foot warehouse. And so we were giving people shots of wild turkey as they came in <laughs> to just, you know, try to get them to live through the experience. And I think, as I handed one to you, you said something like, this was an excellent idea. <laughs> because it was a very long and very cold night. And that was the really just such a heroic, one of the many, many heroic things Joe has done. And I've seen you in a lot of audiences um, doing exactly the same. Um, but you have, at that point and before then, become, became such a hero for me in my own psyche, but also in terms of you know, my hopes and looking for a location as an artistic entity in New York. I mean, when one of the sort of, you know, circles, I think, is that I grew up looking at the work at BAM. And when we made Master Builder, I wanted to work in a footprint that was insane for New York. It was like 40 by 50 feet with 28 foot high ceilings. And that's basically how we wanted to work. And I know for many years people have said, why are you working at this scale? But I, you know, it was partly what I had learned from BAM. So we went to Europe, we toured around, and finally um, Joe brought us back to New York and allowed us to bring Aladdin, our first show, to, to, the, uh, to what was then called the Majestic. Majestic, right. Which is now the Harvey. And um, so it's, it's also, I think I said this to Rosalie, it's like an, a kind of psycho-architectural relationship to BAM that I always had that in my head and in my heart when we were making the work. And it was so deeply fulfilling to be able to bring the work back to that space and to really fit there. And of course, I wouldn't have been able to do that um, without your confidence. Um, so, and that's a, what I also wanted to touch on. And I think you said that very beautifully, Susan, that there's... Joe is just a smooth operator. There's this sense of <laughs> un unbelievable a support. <laughs> what did you say? It's a Sade song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, with a lot of presenters, not all the drama is on stage. There can be a lot of, you know, negotiations. And all of our experiences with Joe have been absolutely seamless, fluid. His quiet confidence has been you know, just remarkable because we've been coming back to the biggest institution in the States and then we get to sit down with the nicest man in the United States. So, um, of course, there, there were a little couple of moments of drama, so I wanted to share with you. One, uh, we recently did Continuous City at BAM, which I love doing, um, but there was a real uh, nightmare on opening night and I actually had our video designer write a little, um, he just sent me an email today that, um, <laughs> that <laughs> goes as follows. When we came back from dinner break on opening night at BAM, we returned to do our final check and found that the main show computer had crashed and destroyed the show file. 
Madness ensued and fear was spreading quickly. Eventually, we located a solution via technologically advanced methods of global tracking and a guy named Jim. <laughs> Jim had written the software and was asleep in Copenhagen when we called him. He gave us a Hail Mary solution that would either restore the show file or destroy it for good and probably the building with it. <laughs> Needless to say, the show file was recovered and the show started at eight on the dot, the audience none, none the wiser to the potential disaster and chaos that had taken place, place moments before. So of course that took years off my life and probably a couple of weeks off of Joe and Alice and Patrick and I know everyone who was in that room was absolutely, I was going insane, but I didn't even see Joe or Alice until after the opening. And that, you know, Joe was just as cool as a cucumber. The confidence that allowed him to just not come downstairs and freak out with the rest of us was um, beautiful. And so I really think of Joe as sort of at the center of this maelstrom. But these little breezes, you know, hardly ruffle you. It's really extraordinary that you can, that you keep on keeping on. Do I have, I have two more things to say. OK, I was looking for some words to describe Joe, so I got some help from the Word 2008 12.2.3 version dictionary. OK, so entertaining, that might describe Joe. Definition, amusing, pleasurable, cheap, and flamboyant. <laughs> Not really. I like the cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, attractive, exciting, fascinating, arousing curiosity or attention. Not boring. <laughs> Um, thoughtful, considerate, attentive, solicitous, selfless, unselfish. And I think that is so true. Unselfish is a huge part of how you make us feel a part of this. Um, friend, pal, buddy, companion, ally, and comrade. And drinking buddy. <laughs> and drinking buddy in there too. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you Marion. It was you. fantastic. Now, before we come to talking to Dan and hearing his stories, I wanted to find a way to enter this visual art world that, uh, that Joe is, has been so a part of and in the most interesting ways. And the conversation with Susan also, she said that Joe, throughout her work, and I, I think the quote was the fact that he always made me think visually about what I was putting into the space. And so suddenly we both stopped there and said, that is such an important part of the way Joe thinks. And again, Marion, tying together your idea of walking around with this image, the footprint, as you described, of the Harvey in your body, in your mm -hmm. brain, all those years, and actually making pieces to fit there. But Susan's comment that Joe made her very aware of how the piece would expand to fill a space visually. Uh, and obviously, there's the music and the dance and all those other elements. Um, was really become so important because, again, as you know, what Joe did in this audience that David was talking about was that over all these years, he's actually brought a lot of different audiences together. And to get art world audiences into a theater is really a miracle. We're talking about the miracle worker. That can be really quite extraordinary. So to actually bridge those different fields, to bring in the art crowd, to look at theater in a very different way, to look at live performance, I think it's um, is, is such an important part of what Joe has achieved because again we, we talk about all these different kinds of performances that happen at BAM and yet this visual art component is such an important part of it and therefore to go from that to have Dan talk about how he as a curator of visual art uh, reads Joe in as a sort of as a fellow curator I thought it was such an interesting comment where you wanted to begin yeah. Well, there, thanks, Rosalie. There were two, yeah, the starting point was, first of all, that I wanted to say something that I was uniquely equipped to be able to address, um, at least on this panel. And, um, and also that I, I needed to kind of come to terms a little bit uh, in the context of my friendship with Joe, um, how, what a great audience member he is. Uh, we have done things over the years together, um, been in different audiences ourselves. Uh, you know, gone to see, you know, Gypsy with Patti LuPone, <laughs> and then a few weeks later we're jumping, or I'm pogoing, to Cafe de Cuba <laughs> at D.B. King. And I, I suppose one of my greatest memories ever of spending time with Joe was um, dancing in the mud a couple springs ago to Stevie Wonder um, <laughs> in New Orleans. And it was mud. It was really great. And it was a very, very memorable performance. <laughs> um, I, I also wanted to do a little bit of full disclosure. I'm a, I'm a 
I not only have benefited once or twice from my association with Joe, I benefit every year uh, because I'm the BAM visual arts curator. And this will be my ninth year of bringing um, visual art made in Brooklyn uh, to BAM so that it opens up at the same time that every Next Wave Festival uh, begins. And it's the only program of its kind in the city. And I think it's really, in a, in a way, a remarkable um, testament <laughs> to Joe's ability to figure out what it was that I could bring to the situation, what my capacity was as a curator to actually contribute something to BAM other than being someone who's in that audience week after week, month after month. So um, uh, I, I'm going to just start and dive into my, in, into my text, which I'm going to have to read quickly now. Um, I don't recall precisely when the job description for curator became something I was fully aware of. But the first example of one that came to the foreground of my post-adolescent consciousness was unquestionably Bill Graham. True. I was and remain an avid music fan, but there is another level on which the programming at the Fillmore East, I'm an East Coast person, uh, beckoned to me as something that I needed to examine more closely. Uh, part of Graham's genius, it seems to me, lay in his inclination to push his listeners beyond their comfort zone. So that an audience coming to see Ravi Shankar might wind up hearing John Lee Hooker as the opening act. And further, Graham's deployment of Joshua White and other creators of psychedelic light shows provided the rock concert with an added dimension of altered consciousness, introducing an element of visual spectacle that still drives the concert industry today. Mm. Now, I mention that because when I first entered the curatorial profession as a French, freshly minted Bennington College <laughs> grad, the art curators whose direction I was most aware of were people like Henry Geldzahler, Walter Hopps, and Marsha Tucker each of whom seemed very natural in the way they fused a European uh, sense of critical inquiry with an inherently American grasp of show business. Although quite different in approach, each of the three had a special genius for making the art experience into something that transcended the stuffy reputations of museums. They inspired a generation of curators to follow in their footsteps. Once I became more committed to my own practice, however, it became gradually clear to me that there was not going to be another Geldzahler, Hops, or Tucker in my generation because they, like Bill Graham, belonged to a completely different age than the one I was operating in. The problem isn't that New York's museums can't make art exhibitions that are serious or memorable. Of course, they can. But rather that museum curators are rarely invited anymore to develop programs that turn museum practice on inside out, uh, stand the institutions on their heads and challenge hordes of otherwise distracted New Yorkers to step inside and experience history in the making. Obviously, there are exceptions, but not as many as one might suppose. That's not to say I haven't been deeply inspired by artistic programming or curatorial practice in New York these days, because fortunately, there's Joe Melillo. <laughs> of course, I do visit a lot of museum and gallery exhibitions, and it's not unusual to see me at the Metropolitan Opera or at a Broadway show or at the Worcester Group, or attending Performa. But the one place in town where you're most likely to find me is BAM. Because to me, it represents the gold standard for what New York's cultural institutions should be doing, if for no other reason than the arrival of the next wave calendar in my mailbox mm -hmm. is truly one of the most anticipated days of the year. Because that's when I get a first glimpse of what my fall is going to be. <laughs> and, and literally how much travel I'm going to be able to do <laughs> because I've got to stay home. As I browse through the schedule, I find myself wondering who the next Bill Forsyth, Robert Lepage, Marianne Weems, Ralph Lemon, or Sankai Juku is going to be. Who of the artists that Joe has invited to Brooklyn this year will shake up my idea of what live performance can be and transport me to a place that I had no idea even existed? What I'm building up to here, if it's not obvious, is a full-on declaration that not only is BAM, under Joe's artistic leadership, the most thrilling place in town to experience the performing arts, but it is much more than that. BAM is truly one of the towering examples of excellence in all areas of cultural programming in New York, whether we're speaking of concert halls, art museums, or any other place, stadiums, where artistic expression takes place. As a friend of Joe's, who always keeps surprised of his travel schedule. Um, of course, I know how much research goes into each season, each choice of artist, 
and each individual performance. I should pause and mention that Joe has been to the Istanbul Biennial, which I organized in 2003, and came to see Prospect New Orleans, mm -hmm. something that I don't think anyone else in his busy, busy, busy situation has been doing <laughs> over the last few years, is checking out biennials, albeit those organized by his friends. <laughs> Joe's commitment to a level of experimentation would not be out of place, uh, that would not be out of place at the most avant-garde venue, is balanced out perfectly by his profound understanding of what makes great theater, great opera, great music, and great dance, assuming that in the future, the lines drawn between the visual and performing arts will be far less rigidly maintained. Right, Rosalie? Um, it's comforting to also think that Joe has given a future generation of curators something they can really aspire to. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. I think this is the moment when the people come in with garlands to throw a video. <laughs> uh, Joe. Yes, Rosalie. Hmm. Uh, no question, we're in just total wonder. You've influenced and shaped every one of us uh, deeply. And what's really exciting is that we're all excited about where you're heading next. Um, there's never a sense that anything stops. Uh, can we just go back a little, though, to rewind sure. to the beginning of the next wave? Because things change. And that idea of being radical then and radical now, these are questions that really interest me. And could you just talk about sort of a, a story from the, the very beginning? And maybe, again, talking about how, you, how your vision is constantly changing. Well, I think it's important to give you the context uh, 1983, New York City, it was a fact. This is not uh, an illusion or rewriting history. This was a fact that we could quantify that American artists like Laurie Anderson and Phil Glass and Robert Wilson, uh, Lee Brewer, could not get their large scale work produced or presented in the country. Uh, so Harvey Lichtenstein had the idea of, of creating in New York City a contemporary performing arts festival dedicated to non-traditional artists. So he um, created the concept. Uh, Karen Brooks Hopkins at that time was the development director of BAM. She worked uh, to identify uh, the financial resources for the endeavor. And then it came to the moment where Harvey needed someone to produce the endeavor. And uh, there were three men who were, there just happens to be three men who were vying for the position. Uh, I was not Karen's choice. Uh, the <laughs> because the, one of the gentlemen who was vying for the position actually had worked for her in the fundraising department. Uh, and they were personal friends, and she was promoting him. Uh, and the key factor here uh, is that in 1982, I produced a big performing and visual arts festival. Again, I didn't create it. I, I actually produced it in Miami and Miami Beach. It was the brainchild uh, of the man who was running an opera company there and using the money from a bed tax in Dade County in the month of June, three weeks. I, I produced 22 world premieres in three weeks. So you know, I actually was standing at the end of that endeavor. And, and what really happened uh, was that Harvey Lichtenstein called um, my former boss, uh, Fred Vogel, who ran a national service agency. And Fred, uh, when Harvey said, this is what I need, he said, Fred said, Malolo is back in town. He just finished producing festival. You should talk to him. So as usual to me and my relationship with Harvey, um, Harvey arranged the meeting at 6 o'clock on Friday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so I go out to meet Harvey, and we had one of those great two-hour chats. And then I had to go uh, on, a, on a particular project that I was, you know, because I came back to New York and I was an independent producer, you know. So, I did, uh, and 
I thought, I'm going to put my name in to do this gig, you know, end quote. I'm going to, you know, I'll, do, I'll produce your festival. I'll just finish producing a festival. So, uh, I was, so I was freelancing, and I had, so that Saturday, I had to go to Washington, D.C. to do my first job with the U.S. State Department through, and where I had to take 14 international artists in the theater across the United States and introduce them to American theater. I go I, to the Actors Theater of Louisville, to the Humana Festival. I'm in the middle of the, that festival with these 14 international artists. I go back to my hotel. There's a message from Harvey Lichtenstein. And he, on the phone, he said, I want you to do this job. I said, great, terrific. I said, we'll talk about money when I come back. And all that. I said, great. Came back after finishing that and we had a wonderful time negotiating my relationship with Harvey over that first job. Uh, but the facts are that I showed up at BAM. There was no office. Obviously, there, there was nothing. <laughs> there was nothing. I had no phone. I mean, obviously, this was, you know, at a time in 1983, you either used the telephone or you wrote a letter. I know that's really ancient history, but that is really what, how you did business, both nationally and internationally. And um, the truth is that I said, OK, what are we going to do? I said, what is it that you want to do, Harvey? He handed me a sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. On the sheet of paper were, was a, just a list of individual artists and, and names of productions. So the first management act I made was to fill out a manila file folder in each one of those names and go about <laughs> trying to figure out how to give this guy what he wanted. He wanted this festival. So it, it, the, the facts were that one of the productions was Einstein on the Beach. And so I you know, dutifully went about with Jed Wheeler, who was at that time representing Philip Glass, and uh, a wonderful uh, man who uh, was running the Bert Hoffman Foundation. Uh, and it became very clear when I met both those artists that it was not possible. I mean, Harvey desperately wanted to do it, uh, the opening of the Next Wave Festival. I said, I cannot do this. I can't do this because it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> the, the sets you know, are in, a, in New Jersey. The backdrops have, you know, are kind of disintegrated. It's just there's no, no time. I know I can make this happen in year two, but I can't make it happen in the first. So that's why the first opening production was the photographer, Far From the Truth, the Philip Glass um, uh, tripartite work that was directed by Joanne Acolytis uh, from Mabu Mines. And it had Jennifer Tipton did the lighting. Santa Locosto did the sets and, and costumes. David Gordon did the movement, dance uh, section. And uh, Wendell Harrington did the projection design. And Robert Code wrote the first part, the play. Center section was the multimedia, which was Wendell Harrington's projections. Of the, the, the content is Edward Moybridge. It's a meditation on Edward Moybridge. So, she was able to manipulate the projections so that you actually saw the body in space and time moving. And third section was the movement section by David Gordon and the pickup company. And all of the music, 90 minutes in length, Philip Glass's Philip Glass Ensemble, all right? So that was in October 1983. And it was controversial. It was challenging work. And New York City had not seen work on that scale. That, and I always will come back to about scale. The Opera House is a beautiful, the Howard Gilman Opera House is a beautiful Mozart, wonderful place, but it's 2,000 seats. So you have that in front of you to confront. And so that began the journey. Long story, but that's the fact. <laughs> Very good story. <laughs> But that was enormous to take all these extraordinary talented people um, in that period uh, who had never gone to stages that, that large. Correct, 
Correct. Uh, that was remarkable. I mean, at the time, you also did have the Le Perc space. Yes. The, the, a little uh, bit of Yes. Uh, the, go back in room. history, you know, that um, the venue that was the Brooklyn Academy of Music in 1983 is not the venue that you'll go to today. You know, you walk in. The, the Opera House is the Opera House. You walk across the lobby, and there was a, a Helen Carey Playhouse. It was a recital hall of 1,000 seats. You had to either take the white marble staircase up to the Le Perc space, or you took the um, elevator to the Le Perc space. And we used to set up the Le Perc space as a 300 seat venue uh, there. So, uh, and if you took the elevator all the way to the top floor, there was the Attic Theater. That was the theater that uh, the Dodgers ran, and Twyla Tharp was in residence at BAM when I arrived in 1983. And so she, that was where she was doing her rehearsing. But basically, the opening of the Next Wave Festival in 1983 was the Opera House, the Playhouse, Le Perc Space. Enormous. One other point that you made, which I was really intrigued, especially something that came up with all the artists here. Um, you need to know if you do, uh, was this idea that you negotiated with um, Harvey because... You always negotiated with Harvey. <laughs> okay. But you don't negotiate with Joe, and this is very interesting, and I experienced... <laughs> <laughs> because of the clarity, and this is what I checked with everybody here, um, because I was fortunate enough to work with Joe, very, very fortunate. A few years ago, I walked in and he kind of, he basically reads you your Miranda rights. He says, now I want to tell you exactly what's going to happen. You have 24 hours. You come into the space. Uh, these are the kinds of concerns we need to understand about what the work needs to be at that point. And then you proceed to have the most wonderful conversation about everything else. And then somebody sitting across the room is told that you will talk to Alice. Back That's now. Alice Bernstein, Executive Vice President. Yeah! Yeah! Um, so I, I just had to get that in when you said you actually negotiated with Harvey because uh, I, I think everybody also described the sense of your absolute clarity, your absolute clarity about what you can offer, what you provide, um, and this, in a sense, division of labor that came with that part of the, the, the business side, or that part that you are prepared to talk about? Does, well, does this make I, sense? I mean, you could totally yeah, disagree I mean, with me. I have a very intimate relationship with Alice Bernstein in terms of, of uh, it's a gift that Alice has that she can take what I'm saying <laughs> and she knows how to translate it back onto paper, quantify it in numbers, and then work with all of who are here, and to understand where these ideas and what the ingredients are that will get to a budget. Um, you know, we're, we're very precise about resources that we can provide. They're modest, uh, but they're always fair. Uh, and, uh, and if I can't do something, I, they know that I can't do it. So I, and oh, let, can we talk about an alternative? Uh, and um, that's, and, but the negotiating part um, is uh, more, much more of a discussion with me. Uh, with there, uh, there's a particular issue that Alice and I had I still come from the generation where I talk, I, I'm emailing Alice, and I feel as though I'm having a conversation. So I say, I've, I've talked to Alice. But there was an, actually an email exchange that we recently had. And I said to her, Alice, no individual artist has a blank check book to work a BAM. And you know that, yes, we have to sit down. We have to lay out the parameters under which we can make something happen. Um, but I, it's not, for me, it's really not negotiation. The negotiation is Alice Bernstein and the general manager, Pat Scully, who's here, uh, they are negotiators. 
they, they know with great sensitivity that the, it's important if I made the decision to invite this artist or this company to come to perform at BAM, they, they understand the values and they approach their negotiations because that's the business of BAM with the appropriate attitude and value. I, which I think is incredibly important because you're also very clear about it and we all learn from that process. Can I open to everybody on the panel? I'm sure you have questions for Joe. I do, I want, oops, yeah. I, I do want to just underscore that because I think that one of the things that's become so important for us is you know when you come to BAM that you are home and that the crew is incredible, everyone there is phenomenal, you are going to load in, it is going to be cared for. You know, again, absolutely frictionless. So that sense of clarity, I think, just goes all the way down to Listen, the other you know, person the who's in the room is Mary Riley. Mary Riley is my right hand. <laughs> uh, Mary Riley is the director of artist services at BAM. She knows how I want artists respected and treated and, and and she knows that she doesn't have a blank check and all the resources <laughs> that she'd like. But there are certain things that we do uh, because we do consider BAM our you know, professional home. And uh, re remember, context. I have a job because these men and women and among, you know, Dan and Bernard Romain, they do what they do. You know, the, I am the steward of an extraordinary resource for the city of New York, one of the great cultural assets of, of New York City, specifically the borough of Brooklyn, but I'm the steward of architecture. It, you know, it, it's beautiful to look at, but it's meaningless unless I have performing artists of all different genres doing their work, and that's, how we understand our relationship to artists. And again, also visual art. And because I trust Dan, and he's expanded my understanding of the visual art and how our spaces, although not you know, uh, exhibition spaces, can accommodate these Brooklyn visual artists in the lobbies you know, of our theaters and certain rooms, and, and so we all have learned. Even the bathrooms, remember, <laughs> <laughs> was used as an exhibition space. So um, that's just to give you sense. Another remarkable part, and again, I'd love uh, the artists here to talk about, is the fact that Joe has this, this enormous sense of responsibility about growing the artists over time, so that there's, there's I never had that feeling, I always have that feeling that that artists will be back and we will see that next moment and that next moment. Mm -hmm. And again, that's extraordinary for all of us because it's an amazing uh, for the artists to think that they can continue to grow in this way and that you will be there, but also that all of us can actually watch an artist's career over time. Well, that's the, the legacy of Harvey Lichtenstein. I mean, that Harvey demonstrated to me how the institution grows with the artist. Big lesson. Uh, and that's why I welcome Philip Glass, uh, Robert Wilson, and uh, Laurie Anderson will open the Next Way Festival this year. You know, because I have that relationship with those individuals that began with Harvey, uh, and I am extending the legacy into the 21st century. Because they do consider, although they perform at other venues in New York City, of course, but there's something uniquely special about their relationship with them. Can I say something about that also? I, I, I don't mean to make it sound like we are all um, um, thin reeds blowing in the wind, but <laughs> But some of the way this works, actually, about um, this long-term relationship as someone who's been to BAM many times, who's been at, who's my, I've had my work done there many times, is that um, sometimes I have um, told you several things I have been working on. And out of all of these things, you know, to me, they're all equal. 
So, but you go, oh, that's the good idea. You know? Oh, no, that's not, don't say it that way. No, no, don't, uh, I don't mean to say that I can't see a good idea without your help. But, but, but I, I think also it's something uh, like what you were saying that, that because these um, events are so important, the existence of the space, the history of what's happened in all of them, that's part of our imagination of where we think art can go. You know, and I think that that's one of the values of BAM for all of this. So when, when I have suggested things to you and you go, I can see this going to this space, um, it helps me see it. It helps me expand that way. I, one other little thing I just want to say, which, which is kind of tangentially about BAM, is that when I was a young composer, um, it was at a time when my teachers did not write orchestra music because no orchestra played such you know, horrible music. And so their opinion was, you know, you know, no one wants contemporary music, so they didn't teach their students how to write for orchestra. Where you imagine your work can go tells you how large you think your imagination can take you. So the existence of BAM and the existence of these opportunities lets us know we should be thinking about being collaborative with other disciplines, about making things which are about social issues that change the course of humanity and society, that we should try to do really big, impressive work, that we, even though we're musicians, we should care what it looks like. Um, you know, there are, these things are issues to us because there is a great place that shows us that, that, that we should pay attention to them. And without that, we would, we would all be doing string quartets or other things. You know, we would be happy. We wouldn't know what we had lost. I, uh, yeah, that's, and again, to go back to scale, you know, because that's what I've inherited uh, history. Uh, the Bam Harvey Theater actually predates the opening of the Opera House. That theater is 1904, and then the Opera House, 1908. I mean, and so, you know, they come out of a, of a different era uh, in American history. And, and, but so making that space possible uh, and challenging all of you to use the space and, and, um, and to feel as though that there is a place. See, I think it's, there's got to be a ban. You know, there, it's, it's just Absolutely. essential that there's a place that gives the artists the capability that they, and the hope, this is the next gen, what you're talking about, the, this, the younger generation, that they can actually know that it is, that there is probability here. Possibility. Yes, yes. Yeah. you know, that this is, there's like, wow, a real possibility that, to, that I could get my work done. Mm. So it puts the emphasis back on the artist. I mean, I always go back to them, you know, and, and it's, uh, and, and uh, that's essentially it, you know, it's, it's, uh, Harvey's phrase, it, follow the artist. And you know, that was his last words to me. As uh, it's, you know, this is, you're going to be the executive producer, the artistic director, bam. That's what, follow the artist. So. Wow. And I have a wonderful board of trustees. The chairman, uh, Alan Fishman, is here that, that understands that's my job. That's, and, like any partnership, as I talked about my professional partner, Karen Hopkins, is why I can say this, we have to do this. We, it's not about me. You see, it's not the cult of personality, even though this evening is. But, <laughs> but, 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 but um, that, it, this is like the job of BAM is to service BAM. You know, it's like there is to make the right artistic decisions for the city of New York, the borough of Brooklyn, you know, for that audience that David uh, referenced in his presentation. Um, you know, it, it, and in so doing, what, do, what does BAM do? BAM reverberates across the country because th there's other colleagues who are also waiting for that Next Wave Festival brochure to hit their mailboxes because 
there's another responsibility that BAM does the R, you know, research and development for the rest of the presenting organizations That's throughout the country <laughs> as to, well, who are these people? True. You know? because, and again, Dan is cognizant about my travel schedule. I'm in play all the time. I do go because it's, you have to show up. You have to be in the theater, engaging in the art to determine, is this the right production for that architecture, for that audience? And, you, and you, you have to always be critical of your research and judgments. And, um, and remember, uh, I say no more often than I say yes. <laughs> and yet you're also opening the future in some extraordinary new ways, like you're creating these new paths where, with two big projects that I know right, and they're so huge, I almost think we should have another two hours to discuss. Uh, one is the bridge project where you're developing uh, a level of theater now that you're taking back into a European environment. Um, and the other, of course, is the, are the new theaters that you will be building in the space across the road. Which yes, we, we broke ground, official amazing. groundbreaking for the Fisher Building, uh, which will be uh, right behind BAM on Ashland Place, former Salvation Army building. That will be our new uh, building. It will be for art, education, and for the community. Uh, 250 completely flexible theater uh, and sprung awesome. floor. You know, uh, it's uh, Karen and I were in our fifth year of the partnership, and uh, Alan Fishman asked, uh, as chairman of the board, but executive committee where the real heavy lifting happens uh, on the board of trustees, he said, okay, uh, what do you need? And I, I didn't have time to obviously to prepare Karen, and I said, to myself, okay, the door is opening, the light is shining, <laughs> pin spot, I'm walking through the door. And I said, what this institution needs now to be responsive to the art making of the 21st century is this, two, I said, less than 300 seat, completely flexible theater uh, that's gridded for digital video and audio that, uh, so the seating configuration could be straight on, it can be four sides, it can be tennis court style, and then there could be no seats at all. Uh, and I said, that's really what I need, specifically, specifically for the Next Wave Festival. Suzanne Youngerman, the Director of Education and Humanities is here. She needs uh, a place to do her work uh, as we begin to more and more provide cultural services to the greater New York City educational system. Uh, we also have a, a robust community and they're looking for a relationship uh, with our education, uh, which would be you know, working uh, after school programs, uh, summer programs. Can't do that in our current spaces, cannot. Uh, as I said, re reference, these are beautiful historic buildings. They're owned by the city of New York. They have to be maintained, and there's construction, and we reserve the months of July and August to do that work. So if Suzanne doesn't have a place to do this kind of work, we will open this facility in the autumn of 2012, and I will be part of the Next Way Festival, et cetera, but in 2013, the Education Department is going to have their presence, and then finally, we will have a, a venue that's appropriate for our community artists in the greater Brooklyn area to be able to respond to their need to have a performance venue. For, and um, okay. so we have a new relationship going with that. The Bridge Project represents Global BAM. Uh, Global BAM, this, today, this week, Recklinghausen, Germany, uh, and they company with two productions, As You Like It and uh, The Tempest, both directed by Sam Mendes, who's the artistic director. Kevin Spacey, artistic director of The Old Vic, is my professional producing partner. Uh, and their organization, we partner together. The company has had a triumphant Singapore, Hong Kong, 
Paris and Madrid, and they will continue to tour after Germany. They go on to uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and then to London, and hopefully Avales for the last week of, of go back to Spain, uh, the last week of August. So um, it began last year with the Tom Stoppard's adaptation of the uh, Cherry Orchard, uh, married to uh, Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale. Uh, again, Sam directing both, and different company of actors, half British, half American. Uh, it has given BAM a very clear producing identity. Uh, and th this is our work. This represents the highest uh, achieve artistic achievement that we can put all those resources together and found you know, through the great uh, um, auspices of Bank of America was our corporate sponsor and, and made that possible and, and we've launched. And uh, it, it has broadened our identity. Uh, and you see BAM's name consistently in the foreign press. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's now a two-way street. You know, it's, it's about being a receiving institution of great work from all over the world, the globe, and we are now a producing organization that's taking the work and distributing it globally. Wonderful. It's exciting. Um, we've all got a lot of work to do. We'll all be there back and forth. Um, a few minutes, I will, are there one or two urgent questions from the floor? <laughs> I think we've covered some wonderful territory, but if um, we've left anything out, please fire a question. I've been really enjoying going to BAM for a long time now, um, but I go with a friend whose husband was really angry when the uh, chamber music program was given up. And I'm hoping that when you have your new building, you could reinstate something like that. <laughs> well, thank you. Now, you know, again, the, the venues for you know, the chamber music, uh, the new Fisher building is, is completely supportive for that kind of, of art. Yes. Um, thank you. I don't know if that improves things. But, um, in the past, you used to have little video clips of, you know, to entice people to come to see performances. But I was wondering if any of the performances in the past have been totally taped, and if there's the possibility of making some kind of archive of performances that, you know, one totally loved, but they're not going to be coming past again. <laughs> That one I, I have a visit directed. either in the theater. The well, seated behind screen. you is <laughs> Bam's full-time archivist, Sharon. Put you. Um, <laughs> so in 1983, we received a grant to archive vid by video uh, from the Howard Gilman Foundation. So all of the Next Wave Festival from 1983 forward has been archived. And then we, uh, at a certain point uh, in time, Sharon, what year then we started doing with the spring? Well, actually, there was a grant that, that paid for some video archiving to start in the 1970s, where they were you know, archiving with one camera in the back of the house. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. well, let's let, just like the Metropolitan Opera now, yeah. there's taping performances, and you can go see it just in HD. In Correct, the yeah. Theater, but if you've missed opening night, they're also rerunning them again. That was fascinating. I'm saying inviting people in who may have missed some of these wonderful performances from the past 20 years, or people who bought them that they would wish they could see again, and have a, a movie. Well, um, that is on our horizon. Um, Sharon's archive is the ham 
archive, Brooklyn Academy of Music archive. Uh, the bottom floor of uh, the Forte Condominium Building, uh, which is the streetscape on, on Fulton Street, adjacent to the Harvey Theater, uh, will be the new location for the archive. It will have public access. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So each step of the way, uh, you know, there's a, certain agreements have to be made, you know, uh, with all the artists to be able to make all that happen. But that is our future. It's not currently now, but uh, definitely on our horizon. One final question. Okay. <laughs> Menu. One yeah. last well, question. I had an important question. Yes. You uh, on the Fisher uh, um, project that you're doing, the building, is the architect been selected? Are you going to leave the building kind of more like as is, or what's the plan with that? Hugh Hardy is the architect uh, for the Fisher building. Uh, and uh, it, the uh, Salvation Army frontage right. must be maintained. The uh, landmarks and art commission determined that the facade, uh, which is from the 30s, uh, that building must be maintained because it adds to the historic nature of Fort Green, Greater Fort Green. So it's not a big building. Um, I'll, I'll explain. It's the you enter on the street and you go downstairs to the, bottom, the ticket uh, area to pick up your ticket, come up, you enter into the theater, as I explained the configurations. Uh, above is the rehearsal hall, then Suzanne and Education Humanities offices and the workspace, and then we're going to have a green roof. Uh, nice. actually, yeah. And so it, it can't go any higher than the opera house. So it, and it's so you have the facade of the building, and behind it, you have the rest of the theater. So, oh, it's brilliant. thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. I think we wanted to uh, invite you all to the reception. Uh, we're looking to an extraordinary future with Joe. We've had some discussion of this remarkable past, and to thank all the artists for their words of not only of praise but of really of it showing us how they've developed and grown with you, you, Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't think we've talked enough about you. Oh, please.